And we're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jeff Rock, and welcome to another D. Hilton Associates webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing incentive metrics and employee engagement strategies for 2021. Obviously, a very important topic and one I'm extremely excited about, especially uh, the cast and crew that I have in here today, the experts are going to bring to the table. But first, let's talk about a little bit of uh, administrative options here. Uh, we are going to be recording this webinar, so if you do miss anything, uh, please go to our website at dhilton.com. You'll be able to find a recording of this webinar and all the past webinars as well. Uh, give you an opportunity to catch up on anything that you may have missed in the past. We're going to try to keep the conversation to about 45 to 50 minutes to save about 10. Good luck. Yeah, good luck with this one. <laughs> We're going to try to save 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. But if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and use the Q&A section or you can use the chat box. Let us know. We might be able to answer those questions on the fly. Uh, but otherwise, we'll try to get to them at the end. And if we can't get to all the questions, we'll certainly circle back around to you after the presentation. Also, you'll receive an email at the end of this after about two days, I believe, that will have a survey included in there. Let us know how we're doing, what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, that'll kind of give us an opportunity to grow and develop from there. It'll also have this slide deck. We've finally gotten to the point where there's going to be a slide deck involved in that. Uh, I love you guys, but sending out all those slide decks, that was a lot of slide decks I had to send. So there'll be a link in there. You'll be able to get that slide deck uh, requested right there, and it'll be able to download it after that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce John Andrews. How are you, John? Doing great. Thank you. And I also have Dr. Rhodes joining us this time. How are you, Dr. Rhodes? Doing great. Thank you. All right, John, please take us away. I just want to introduce everybody to Dina. Um, D. Hilton doesn't work without data. <laughs> and she is just a master of putting this together. So, you know, when I see something with a thousand dots, I said, well, what's the most sparkly ones, I guess. But <laughs> you're able to tell a story. And so... We get the benefit of your knowledge today. So I appreciate you being here and no pressure. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. It's very kind of you. So everybody, welcome to month 14 of 2020, as, as I like to call it. Um, today, when we, we look at the program, we're going to think of two themes. One is, you know, we just finished a round of incentive plans and what the metrics, how we're going to keep score in 21. I want to get that on the table because it's not too late to, to, to modify things you might be doing. And the second thing is, how do we get um, the, this concept of engagement going and, and as we get to a new normal. And my definition of new normal is going to be if everybody gets a shot, you know, vaccine by the end of March, we got one new normal. If it's June, it's one. If it's next year, it's another one. So we're going to talk a lot about just being agile, being fluid in this and, and how do we keep score. So those are two things I think you're going to get out of it today. Um, so our first topic that we want to look at is what, what did we find? How did 2020 play, play out? And what are the metrics people are going to use for 21? Um, on this slide, what we found are the, the plans that we, you know, we do a lot of incentive scorecard certification. We've helped people put together definitions of success. So what we saw, the average payout or accomplishment rate was 96% of target. That's about 10% lower than what we see in the last two or three years. So on the, the left column there, the payouts have been 82% at the 25th percentile, 82% of target, not 82% payouts. 91% was the median and then 112 at the 75th percentile. So that 91 and 96 kind of kind of jive as the middle. And again, about 10% less than we've seen in the past. So I had a ton of meetings from the middle of the year till the end of the year in 20 and said, hey, guys, do you want to modify the plans? And only 22% of our clients adjusted their plans and only 5% canceled. But what was interesting as we went through these meetings in November, uh, December and January and, and into February, boards wanted to recognize and use discretion. So we have this balance of, you don't want to change the rules too often, you know, because we've got this good plan, we've got education, we've got commitment, and then, you know, we don't want to just throw it up and do something else. But the three big things that people paid for was under leadership under crisis. So people wanted to use discretionary rewards for moving successful transition of getting all their workforce to work from home, successful um, keeping people safe, members and employees during the, during the period. And then finally, um, you know, being able to keep this seamless to the member. So if the member needed you, you answered the phone. If they, if you did an online app, you, you got an answer. So that what, that's what we should pat ourselves on the back for. And then unfortunately, you know, we bill ourselves as safe and sound. And guess what? People pick us up on it. 
He came running in. Yeah. <laughs> so we on, on our evaluations, what we did was we looked at a specific thing, leadership under crisis, and we had a 92% approval rating across the industry. So that means um, we did a really good job and we're still doing it. The one criticism that we had out there, and, then, and, and I encourage everybody to kind of pick this up during planning and, and into next year is closing the loop. And one of the things, the biggest concern for, for, for volunteers was we weren't, up, we weren't informed up front. Mm -hmm. You know, but a good leader is going to say, look, I got to do these things because we got to get everything ready for the members. We got we to keep things going. There's a lot of unknowns. And so kind of that thing, I beg for forgiveness. You know, I'm going to do the right thing. Trust me on this. But boards want to be involved. Mm -hmm. So as we go through this, anything that you can do on the back end to say, this is why I made a decision, you know, not defending good or bad or if it worked or didn't work, but just say, this is why I did it. You know, and then that goes into the deposit bank of you know, when we have to do this again. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point. It's not a matter of building consensus. It's a matter of, okay, I saw a critical incident. We had to actually do something about it. Now it's time to talk about how we did something about it to bring them in on the process as well. And probably the worst performing executives in any industry are going to be the consensus builders mm -hmm. during time of crisis because it's just, sometimes you're just going to have to say, I got to go with what I got to go with, mm -hmm. right? So our... um other thing we wanted to bring to we usually send this in the fall, but you know, we thought it was more important to get it out. So we kind of fast tracked this. So we looked at what are the metrics people are putting in their plans for 2021 and then look at the delta of how that changed from, from 20. And so we, we believe in balanced scorecards, you know, and you know, that's how we think a not-for-profit financial institution should look at their business. It's not just for total shareholder return. It's not for making us gobs of money. It's, it's that balance of, making money so we can provide goods and service to as many people as possible. I mean, it's oversimplified, but that's what we want. So in the scorecard, we always look at what do we do for members who are our owners? What do we do for the members who are customers? You know, anybody usually can be a member for five bucks or 20 bucks, but the customer is the one who uses us, you know, for the car loan and the checking account and, and maybe a mortgage, how are we managing the risks of the business, how are we do in pricing, how we make sure we're in the right products, right delivery channels, those types of things. And finally, governance. You know, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. It's so important in, in the not-for-profit world. So you look at this list, guys, and you go, board evaluations always have been on the top. We'll never, I don't think they'll ever be <laughs> that's, moved. That's the rock right yeah. there, right? <laughs> and then number two, an ROA, always, you know, we want to generate revenue to show and support of why, why we're going to pay out incentives or recognition plans. And member satisfaction went up 14 points. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yeah. So some people were saying, you know, there's always been this argument, well, people vote with their wallet. So we don't have to look at actual evaluations and feedback from members, you know, you know, but the folks that just do it that way, you get a cranky letter from a member and then you spend two hours at a board meeting talking about that. And then there's no perspective or context. Is this, is this an example of a thousand members having a problem or is this just a cranky member? Mm -hmm. So what we've seen is we've got to get more quantifiable data into the mix and people are taking, you know, that to task and, and doing a better job with that. Delinquency obviously is the unknown. So people have put that a little higher than they have in the past is, you know, people got stimulus checks and they saved it. You know, people are slowly coming back to work and, you know, we, we were just thinking we we're going to have this delinquency problem. We haven't yet. And, and it, that was probably the hardest thing to budget in 21 was to say, what do you think we should do? Every month, more information. So every mm -hmm. month it stays good, it stays good. Um, so I'm not going to go down the whole list. Uh, what, I, what I was really happy with is we're, we're, we're proponents of relative metrics, not historical metrics. So when times are good and we all raise, so if, you, if, if deposit growth was a metric and you grew 10% this year and you've never grown more than 5%, you could go to your board and say, this is the best year ever. You know, I'm awesome. <laughs> But then if the market grew 12%, you know, everybody had stimulus money come in and people were saving, um, then you actually lost market share. Yeah, relative. The That's relative, what we're looking for. <laughs> relative is the key. So you go down the list and why I have highlighted in blue down there is you're not supposed to use long growth and you're not supposed to use your camel rating <laughs> as, as uh, incentive metrics. And we have a few people that still do. And there it is. So I've done my disclosure. Will they come after you? I don't know, but at least I told you. <laughs> Try to use something else. <laughs> um, so, so with that said, other themes I wanted to talk about here is when you look at calibration of how you hit a target, we don't believe in cliffs. You know, 
all or nothing. So if the ROA is 50 basis points, you hit 449. I don't think that's necessarily a fail yeah. here. So that you got to give a landing zone around close, you know, still good and close, but not just all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, when stretch, you know, this is not the time to be really pushing, pushing, pushing out there. So one of the themes that we've looked about is a little tighter calibration on threshold target and stretch of goals this year. Maybe we expand later, but this year I think it's safe to be, let's, let's try to manage to that, to that, that target more than we have in the past. Yep. Okay. And then the other one is, you know, when I was in school and in the nineties, I was in school a lot earlier than that, but in the nineties, <laughs> this concept of economic value added. So came it came in the for-profit world and it's just the concept of you're supposed to grow five percent or get a return on a piece of equipment and you don't get it you know you're supposed to get ten percent return on that machine and you get nine percent you owe me a percent for next year plus what you're supposed to give me next year so a lot of times in credit unions we start over you know like oh we'll get them next year so what we've seen is you know just have the philosophical discussion if you're in the middle of a five-year plan and, you're, and you've got a growth rate you know, and, and this year is not where you want it to be. Do you just start over or do you say you owe me the, the Delta from last year plus what, uh, what we were supposed to do this year to keep on track? I think it's a really good discussion. There's not a right answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think, you, you know, you owe the organization to say, how do we get back on track? It comes down to that business strategic decision that you need to make of the direction moving forward. Because if we change the rules too often, okay, we'll get them next year. Okay, we'll get them next year. And we start over, that becomes... Um, that, that, that leads down a path of we're not going to be the strongest organization. Mm -hmm. We're not going to differentiate. You know, we're not committed to that excellence. Kind of goes back to managing by crisis at that place. You're not really yeah. being strategic per se. You're just managing, okay, well, now we got to do this different. Exactly. So when we look at the for-profit world and we look in the boardrooms and we look at uh, the SEC documentation on, you know, they're having to do a boatload more stuff and tell their shareholders what they're doing in the committee probably said, why did I take this job? <laughs> because they pay you a lot of money. That's why they give you a lot of stock. But the three things that they're working on in 21 is executive retention. And, you know, we're not the only industry that has supply and demand issues at, at the top. So when they're looking at their compensation reward recognition programs, they're definitely looking about how they tie re retention into that. But in the credit union space, that's always been, you know, supplemental retirement, longer term arrangements to make sure people stay. And then the second thing is in enhanced governance, simply meaning uh, people, we're going to be accountable. You know, people are going to start snooping about what we did and why we did this. And we can't, you know, Aunt Myrtle can't be the marketing person and get three times as much money as everybody else in the industry because they might ask questions about that. So we've seen that. And, and what we've done in our practice is trying to use those SEC standards of how an exec comp committee uh, documents and 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 presents its information and that and and use that caliber that benchmark of how we do it nobody will ever see it but if it ever happens down the road that we have to you know the 10 billion dollar club and above have to do more disclosures and and there's more peaking of what we do mm -hmm. so we're ready for any of that so again how we translate what the the for-profit world is doing let's let's do more of that making sure that it is we're accountable it's transparent we're using good data and we're doing pay for performance. And then finally, the pay for performance alignment. You know, if, if we're going to pay out money and there are big packages out there that we, they know why, you know, it's a regulator, it's a member, if, it's an, if they're looking at a 990, you know, that they know it's why, why we're successful is because of pay for performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So kind of our, our next topic is uh, engagement. And, you know, that's one of, one of Dina's, Gosh, that's, how long have you been working on this? A few years. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did I ask an inappropriate that question? That was the perfect uh, yeah. PC answer there. It's been a while. <laughs> that reminds me, one time my uh, daughter, she went to University of Oklahoma and we would we'd drive. One time we were driving back from, from Houston to Oklahoma and I fell asleep and let her drive and she was going 95. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was a Jeep. It was a nice ride. So I was you know, a little bumpy and I go, Catherine, how fast are you you driving? And she goes, a good amount. <laughs> okay. We'll just we'll just leave it at it's yeah. good. Okay. It's good. Okay. So anyway, I'm gonna <laughs> turn it over to Dina and talk about this next time. Sure. Okay. So now we're gonna segue into how to engage employees, especially um, during this 
period of dealing with the pandemic. So first of all, let's make sure we're on the same page as to what is engagement. Um, people tend to use a variety of different definitions. So engagement is basically a positive, fulfilling state of mind uh, where employees are working at very high energy levels, they're dedicated to the job task, and they are completely engrossed in the work that they're doing, as if time is flying by. Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the signal. All right. So um, I was so excited she used plethora. So when we did the run through of this, I go, I had a professor in, in first year of, of graduate school said, there's only two words you need to use to impress people, plethora and paucity. So you're halfway there. I'm so glad I made the checklist. On. But please try to get paucity. In paucity. There by the end. <laughs> we'll drop a dollar word in there every chance we get. Yeah, there you go. Next will be cornucopia. We've got Am I going back to the previous slide. I'd oh, like to yeah, talk about sure. some of the benefits that are actually associated with an engaged workforce. So if you have engaged employees, um, this is associated with higher levels of job performance, productivity, um, higher organizational commitment. So employers are more likely to stay. You avoid the costs associated with turnover. And employees who are engaged also have higher levels of intrinsic motivation, which is very important. So they're really enjoying the job tasks for themselves um, as opposed to other things like the pay. Um, and another important factor about engagement is that your members are also more satisfied. Members are more engaged themselves. You have increased member loyalty when you have engaged employees. So as John mentioned, there are numerous benefits associated with a plethora, a plethora. workforce. A yes. veritable cornucopia. <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm sticking with that one. Cornucopia is not going to happen. Jeff. Oh, come Stop on. trying to make that happen. It's 2021. We got a new different direction. Plethora is yesterday. <laughs> and I think you make a really, really great point about the intrinsic portion of engagement, because when it's an intrinsic thing, it's not something that you can actually buy. You can't uh, incentivize that out of people per se. It's something that have to be invested. That's something they have to give. Uh, so using those strategies to be able to put those pieces together to pull that intrinsic value out. Uh, that's going to be a big key to a lot of the engagement pieces. Yes, and uh, making sure that people have that intrinsic motivation can be challenging. And there's ways that you can increase the likelihood that people will be intrinsically motivated and engaged in the organization. Now, it's interesting because, as the slide says, only 36% of employees in the U.S. are engaged uh, at work. Now, this equates to about 95 million employees who are either indifferent or actively disengaged. Um, is that self-reported or is that um, like self-reported? Okay. Yes. And fortunately in the credit union industry, engagement levels are a bit higher, about 66%, according to uh, a 2020 politics study, which is also consistent with our peer data. Now, this leads to the question of what motivates employees uh, or drives employee engagement. So some employees are just naturally more likely to be engaged than others due to their personality. So for instance, employees who are more proactive or ambitious, conscientious, extroverted, or just have a general positive affect, these employees are more likely to be engaged at work. So what they're doing is they're driving energy and resources towards the job tasks. And that's why they're getting stuff done and they're also intrinsically motivated. And that's infectious to coworkers? Yes, yes. As we'll talk about later, that, um, that kind of energy transfers to other coworkers as well and can get them engaged um, as well. And job characteristics themselves are also incredibly important for motivating and engaging employees. So for instance, do you have the autonomy to carry out work tasks? Do you have a variety of skills that you're able to use on the job? Um, are you responsible for one piece of the puzzle or are you able to put together a project from start to finish? Is the task actually important or significant in any sort of way? And are you receiving feedback on your work? That's all very important in order to becoming engaged in your work. So we added a series of COVID-19 related questions to our employee surveys this year uh, to find out how the pandemic, uh, <laughs> sorry, to find out how the pandemic it, uh, impacted employees. So we found that highly engaged employees are more likely to feel that the credit union values employees' well-being during the pandemic. We found that engaged employees feel that the credit union is a safe place to work, that the credit union has been flexible or accommodating during the pandemic, and that communication uh, during the pandemic has been. 
And additionally, engagement during the pandemic has been quite high during 2020, uh, an average of five on a scale of one to six. And in fact, on a one to six point scale with six indicating maximum engagement levels, employees, 87% of employees had an average engagement score of four or higher. So incredibly high. And it, this has indicated that COVID-19 really hasn't negatively impacted engagement this year. However, later on um, in this webinar, John will elaborate more on why he thinks that is. Oh, can we go back one? Let's talk about engagement crossover real quick. So a big issue today is how to keep employees motivated during COVID-19 specifically. So as we alluded to before, one way to do this is engagement crossover, which is the transfer of engagement. So there's support in research that when people are frequently working together, person A's engagement positively influences person B's engagement and in turn person B's job performance. Now, does this have to only be in person? No. Research suggests that this can be over email, over the phone, or any other method. It does not have to be face-to-face. -face. So as long as you're keeping up those frequent interactions, you can uh, transfer that engagement to other coworkers. Yeah, and, and the frequency is going to be the challenge. I mean, yeah, we had a spike at the beginning because everybody was trying extra hard to communicate, connect, and then, you know, yeah, get, stuff happens. The dog needs to go out. Uh, you know, the kids need to be tutored and you're trying to do this from home. You're trying to do it within retail hours. And it, it, it became a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll talk about a little bit later, but you know, frontline managers, you, you know, they were told, Hey, make, make the connections, check how your people are doing. And then over time, you know, we saw that drift. So we got to get back on board. This is month 14. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got to go back to what March, April, May look like of last year. I think the other hard part of that is that we deal so much uh, from a social perspective of actually being in front of somebody. You can read social cues and see what's going on. So we got kind of accustomed to how we interact with individuals in that case. You know, managers will know, oh, hey, you're, you're looking a little tired. Maybe I should go talk to them about something. Yeah. Uh, the big thing was is that we we lost kind of focus on how to really ask engaging questions and, you know, ask an open-ended question when it comes down to it rather than, you know, uh, are you good today? You know, yes, no, versus uh, tell me a little bit about how things are going today. You know, that way we can establish that connection when you're touching point. That's going to work when your kids are in high school too. And they, you say, how's your day? And they go, fine. Fine. Yeah. Gonna, <laughs> but it's, let's see how that technique works for you. Yeah. There's another <laughs> yes and no. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> right. Thanks. I'm prepared now. I'm ready. <laughs> So our next next slide here, we're talking about, okay, some of the tech, some of these are like the definition of obvious, but as Jeff and me and I joke about this, it's repetition, repetition, it's consistency. You know, you can do this, you know, every day engagement changes, it's fluid. You know, if I, if I ask the same person to take the test five days in a row, I could get five different answers. Um, you'd hope it'd be consistent, but just, just you know, the environmental factor. So one of the things that when you look at this list, the idea of, I love this, larks and owls, you know, the idea is that there's early birds and there's late, late birds. And, you know, when do you want to work is a huge thing that goes to engagement is like, you can pick your hours and you can pick where you want to work and you want to pick the time, you know, how much production you want to do. But the challenge with that is we're in a retail environment. We're open from nine to five or the phones are supposed to be open between these hours. And we're trying to make that work, you know, accommodate the employee's strengths with what the, the member's expectation is. And that's always our challenge. Um, we see a lot of people dealing with well-being and healthy lifestyles in, in, in the pandemic and anything that we can do to make sure that they're not, not tied to the phone, tied to the screen, and make sure they're taking break, breaks is, is, is so important to keep that score up. Um, you know, the external communications when it comes to remote workers, we've got to include them in our culture. We've got to make sure that we're making those accommodations. My, you know, my prediction is, we're not going to be a hundred, if we're a hundred people shop, we're not going to be a hundred people in a building anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be this core group and they're going to be out there and we're going to have these really strong, talented people in other parts of the country. But how do they, how do they understand our culture? And that's going to be a huge commitment for frontline managers to, to deal with. And then, you know, being able to measure, you know, in our, in our practice, we don't promote it a lot, but it's always been there. And we have a tremendous data set. We do custom work. And that's why, you know, Dina could get the questions on, uh, on COVID, 
because we're not tied to a instrument because we develop our own instruments. And then we can look at the statistical validity and, and we can do that custom work. And so, you know, net promoter score has an option out there, but, you know, it, it, sometimes it oversimplifies the issue. Sometimes pulse surveys, you know, I always go back. Did you, did you know I was a Disney graduate? I did not. I went. You uh, can tell by the ears. Yeah. <laughs> 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 or, or is it the photo I keep in my back pocket? Oh, I mean, okay. I, okay. Yeah, I might agree. <laughs> But one of the things I learned at, at, from the Disney Institute is they measure everything. You know, they have a they have a ten minute meeting. They have to fill out a form. Said, was this a waste of time? Did you learn anything? What could we do different? This meeting could have been an email. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's two people, two kinds of people in the world: the people like Disney, and the ones that don't. The ones that love Disney will fill out those forms <laughs> all the time. Like, how was your experience and all those things? But we have to. What we're going to kind of set the stage for today is you can't just say we're going to we're going to measure things and survey and check the box that we did it. We have to provide the feedback and we have to provide some changes to things. And so that's what's very important. So when we look about how we're going to create this environment, you know, it isn't enough to have a strong you know, external framework. We need to look with the internal motivation. So you kind of set the stage, Dean, I was talking about people just intrinsically have, you know, these, these competencies and these, these worldviews that are infectious and, the, and, and, and they work in the retail environment. And we need to transfer those to, to our to our businesses, as we would say, but we also need to identify that and we can't make them lose it. You know, cause I mean, any man, you know, a bad boss can make you lose that enthusiasm pretty quickly. So again, we need to make sure that we're, we're looking as senior managers, looking at that very, very, very frequently, so to speak. So when we look at motivation, there's so many, obviously so much literature out there, but if we boil it down to three things that we think work in the, credit union retail relatedness. And this is a huge advantage that credit unions have over banks and other financial institutions. We're a not-for-profit financial cooperative. Our 20-somethings and our 30-somethings that do Habitat for Humanity, you know, they'll do mission work, they'll do volunteer work. They love the idea that, you know, this is not going to a shareholder, this is going back to the member. And sometimes we don't do a good enough job of, you know, hyping that, so to speak. But if we walk the walk of that, you will have engagement. You will have people stay longer because they understand there's a purpose for that work. And, and, and I know I'm redundant, but you know, I love annual reports that talk about how many single moms we got cars for so they could go to work, how many kids first time, you know, first kid to go to college, um, how many houses we, we, you know, first time home, home buyers were able to get a loan because of the credit union. Is it feel good? Is it sappy? I don't know, but it's, what we're here for. And there's plenty of research out there that shows just understanding what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, how that impacts people in a meaningful way. You're immediately more connected to that uh, company, organization, whatever the situation may be. So having those stories that may seem like a fluff piece, but it's actually having a big impact yeah. on people. Yeah. And, and again, you know, that's what's make us special. That's our culture. We should never deviate from that. And that's the eye on the price. So to speak. And then the competence. Um, for so many years, we were follow the rule organizations. It was this way or no way, because there would be a violation of a policy. There'd be a violation of whatever, you know, if there was an audit. And so people were actually afraid to be, um, you know, to go outside of, you know, what the narrow defined jobs were. And I think the more that we can hold people accountable to do the right thing for members, we're going to be successful. Um, that's why I always mention the Nordstrom, Nordstrom's employee handbook. It's like two sentences, like do what you think's best for the customer. And if you have a question, ask your boss, you know, while we're developing thousand page tomes <laughs> on what you can and cannot do. And they're just saying, Hey, you know, customer's going to need you. If you can answer, there's going to be higher satisfaction mm -hmm. rates. They're going to use our store more. And they just see that as a value chain. And then autonomy again, follow the rules, people, you know, follow the rules and then they do the work and they go home, but you have the autonomy. They're engaged with the problem. You know, Mr. Jones needs that answer by three o'clock or he doesn't get the car that he's been waiting on for, you know, for his whole life. You know, as sappy as that sounds, the people that get that and they have the autonomy to make those decisions, you know, are much more successful. Yeah. It, it really kind of boils down to engagement is getting their head and their heart in the game. Yeah, uh, you have to logically understand why you're there, and then you have to have the passion behind understanding what you do on a day-to-day -day basis matters. Yeah, so um, this is personal opinion. So put put that. I in. got the mute. Hold on, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, the hardest job in a credit union is a frontline man. Mm-hmm. You know, you start with your managing your buddies, you know, you used to be one of the crowd and you, you know, you, you've been promoted and now you have to tell them to follow the dress code and show up on time. And, you know, you're not doing this correct. And but that's not what makes it hard. What makes it hard is you've got these groups above you saying two things, follow the rules, follow procedure. Um, don't deviate because that's how you're going to be held accountable. And then you got people below you, two groups, treat me special, name, not a number, make an exception for me. And you know who that is? That's members because they want to be special and employees. They want to be special. And you're in the middle trying to make these two conflicting, you know, strategies work. And so during COVID, that frontline manager was just stressed out Mm -hmm. and still is to a degree. But again, how how do we get that, that person to feel good about that and maintain our culture, do it in a different operating style, whatever the new normal is going to be. And one of the things that, that we've had as a product for a long time is a kind of a, I call it a new normal performance management system. In the old days, you know, it's just classic, right? Set some goals, give them some feedback or don't give them feedback and then do once a year saying you're good or you can stay or you're probably getting no raise and you should leave. And then people were in the dark for so much of the time. And, you know, everybody's had a bad boss in their future and their past and, you know, don't, don't uh, like dealing with this. And so as we re-engineer what's going to be, you know, reward recognition in a new normal, you know, how do we look at it? Mm -hmm. You know, and so this idea of it, you know, we need to be agile that maybe the goal we start off with January 1st is not the goal we have December 31st. We've got to have ongoing court conversations with folks to see how, how fluid it actually is, you know? And as soon as you say, you must talk to your employee weekly, guess what? <laughs> you know, you cross your hands and you go, another thing they're making me do. It's just got to be organic, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I think I've told this story before, but it's, it's, it's just one of the most things that left an impression to me. I got to go to um, Michael Jordan basketball camp, fantasy camp. And I got to talk to all these legendary coaches. And one of the coaches, Hubie Brown said every, every time before he had a practice, he went to every employee I mean, every of his players and said, how are you today? You know, you having trouble with your girlfriend, your wife, you know, the decorator, uh, your endorsement deal didn't come through your contract is they're sitting on it. And then he would talk to his assistant coaches and get a read from 15 to 20 guys, whoever was on the team and say, today, we can't even practice. Go today's on. not the Go day. On. Today is not to learn anything new. And then today is, wow, everybody's head's on, right? Let's, let's try something new. And that's what we want in a frontline manager. So now you're remote. You said it earlier, Jeff, how, how do I look at those visual cues and mm-hmm. you know, what's going on in their life? Some days it's not today to push the goal. Today is to get through today. And then maybe tomorrow it's once we feel good about that, then we you know, go for that ultimate goal. So anytime we, we force it, you know, it's just got to be organic, so to speak. Absolutely. So, and in general, the transition that we've had from the performance management is from, you know, like a yearly thing to something that's actually much more organic, like you're talking about a frequent check-in. And what we want to do is we, we kind of want to step away, give those managers an opportunity to talk about what they would do with the employee rather than how they feel about that employee. Here's my thoughts. Here's, you know, a lot of biases can come in in that case. So what we kind of put together is these future focus statements where it looks at what the manager would actually be doing with the employee, given the situation that they're in now. Uh, So questions like, I would always go to this employee when I need extraordinary results and have that on a five-point scale. Uh, This gives HR some actual viable content that they can look at, judge, and evaluate uh, for what the manager is planning to do with this person. Uh, So it's very simple. It's very straightforward. And you can get to the answers to these questions in organic matter. It's not a matter of checking, okay, I've got to go at question one. I've got to go to question two or question three. It's when you have a conversation with your employees, these are already in the back of your mind. You know that, hey, I've been Zooming with this employee most times. When something goes wrong, I go to this person. You've already answered that question. You already have that response. So it's not a matter of sitting down and having to have a performance review. And the same things hold true. So basically, you can get to the core of what you would want to do with the employee, how they're doing, and then give them a rating based off of just four questions. You don't need that tome of uh, a tactical manual, so to speak, of they did this little thing great. They did this little and they need help here and they need help here. This gets to the core of what you're planning on going there and puts it in a forward uh, future focus perspective. And I think the the, the biggest thing there is that last question there, 
uh, once you've talked about what you plan to do with that, if uh, another important question is, if I could, I would promote this employee today, scale of one to five. So after you've talked about that, you say, well, okay, how, what can they do in the next 90 days to improve? Where can we go from here? It's not talking about, okay, what you did in the past, this is what we don't want you to do, or this is the things that didn't go well. Let's talk about, okay, moving forward, let's see what we can do. And here's our plan in the next 90 days. The, the genesis of this concept came from one of the big accounting firms. You know, a few years back, they looked at, they counted all the hours that their supervisors and managers were doing on performance management. And they go, these are hours we're not billing clients. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there, there wasn't an altruistic need to be better with our employees here. It was just like, we got to get these hours back somehow. And they really, you know, kind of what went with this concept and what I love about it. And we've moved this to the credit union space. So we have, we have, we, we offer this as a product and we've done this for a number of credit unions, whereas just get rid of that, what it has to be, mm -hmm. what it could be. And what I love about that, and even if you have a structure, even if you use performance management software, use this technique is, is our suggestion because it, 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 it prompts a structured example. You know, so that question is, um, you know, if, if, if I had something, I, you know, I guess let's use that, that first one. If I, if I, who do I go to if I have something I need to do and get extraordinary results? And you say, it's Dina. The reason you're doing Dina is because, you know, two months ago when I asked you to do something, it was like beyond my expectations. And so all of a sudden now I've got a real world example. And you like, have actionable, you can actually take action on it now. That's my point. Yeah. That's my point is, you know, when you start with, and I've used this example before, but it's so important. Um, you know, when a teacher at school said, write a thousand word essay on anything you want, the hardest part of that is the what first are you word, talk about? the subject, <laughs> subject, what are you going to talk about, right? But if the teacher said, what, a thousand word essay on what you did for summer vacation, ah, I just gave you structure, right? So by using these four questions, we can prompt people because the number one weakness of a performance appraisal is get all fives, you get all threes. How mm -hmm. fast can I do it? I got 17 of these to do by next Tuesday. But if you, if you kind of use this as a speed bump, these four questions, all of a sudden I got you some real world examples of, you know, Jeff delivered this and Dina delivered that. And, and it just, it, it can make it meaningful. So if you're, if you're beholden or you contractually, you can't get out of it, or if the CEO says, I want to use this system, great. But this is a technique I think that you can piggyback with or have the guts to scrap the whole thing and make it a real streamlined process. And I guarantee you, you'll save some hours from your manager's, uh, you know, day. And, mm -hmm. and get that engagement up. I mean, all this stuff works in a remote workforce as well. Yeah. I mean, it's like we've yeah. kind of, we saw this coming. I don't know what happened here, yeah. John. We planned ahead for this because it is quick, it is fast, and it actually builds a good relationship because you're having a true conversation with somebody. And that, that's kind of the segue to this slide is the idea of that, that engagement with remote, remote workers. So look, the chart's a little complicated. I hope I say it right. So Help, help me guys. <laughs> we'll keep you honest over here, John. So that see this, the orange line, if, if you're working with us in color today, <laughs> that that's, that's an employee that's, that's outside of the office of working remote at least 80 to hundred percent of the time. So that's kind of our heavy, heavy person that's gone. And the, the, the dark blue line is the person that's gone less than 10%. So you see, if, if you provide feedback once a year, that the person that's out of the office at 19% is the highest, which is weird, but it's, Hey, they signed up to be away. They don't expect anything at the beginning. So they're okay. They, they have more tolerance to being abandoned. But you know, if you walk by the same person every day and they in the office every day and you don't recognize the work, if you don't engage, guess what? You know, that's why they start below. And then simply by the frequency and Dina, you talked about that the frequency of the, of, of, of the engagement or the, the interactions makes this go up. So what you want to go 19 to 63, you want to go 10 to 51, you want to go 10 to 57, pick, pick, pick your, pick your number. It just works in all levels. So we can't use remote workforce is going to hurt our overall engagement because they're remote baloney. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take? It's going to take the redoubling the efforts to make sure the contact is up. So we have essentially absence makes the heart grow fonder, but we still need to actually touch base to make sure. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. So what, I, what I'm following right now is Boston Consulting Group is doing something about, well, if, if, if there's going to be a new normal, we're going to have to change leadership. So the three things that are the four, as you can see, the three things. <laughs> <in the chair. laughs> Let me count this again here. There's four things. <laughs> but but I, what I love about it is rethinking the art of possible. You go back, uh, quiz, quiz, Jeff. Oh, no, I didn't study for this. I know. <laughs> Charles H. Duell, who is that? That's a person. And uh, I'll... 
he's from that place and that thing, and I'll never forget him. <laughs> well, well, he was he was around in 1899, so you know, get a break there. But he was he he ran the U.S. Patent Office, and his classic quote is, "Everything that can be invented has already been invented oh. in 1899." A very, uh, a very astute observation. Yeah, there. that, yeah, that, that, that went really well for him. Tom Watson said, "We only really, the world only needs about five computers." Great moments in the hall of shame of <laughs> predictions, right? So, when you look at it, the managers that are going to be perform, whether we're doing recruiting and we're looking for, you know, new talent to come on board, or we're we're transitioning existing talent to work in the new normal, we have to rework what's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that's you know, what are the cliches? Well, we tried that. It didn't work. We've always done it this way. All that stuff is going to be out because we're going to have to work fast. You know, but, you know, if you have a five-year strategic plan, you might as well say it's two-year plan. When, it, when, when I worked with KPMG, I had a client and it was in the high tech world and they, it's, it'll date myself, but they made internal modems for laptops. The, the life of this product was 90 days. They had to Design it, engineer it, manufacture it, sell it, and deliver it in 90 days or they didn't get paid. Hmm. The company doesn't exist today. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Could never put my finger on it. But, but the idea of if you can't you know, shave cycle times, if you can't shave how fast you need to get something to a member, that's not going to differentiate your business. Anymore. So what are the managers? You know, the manager that we're going to want in the future is going to be able to look at um, them. You know, managing processes, right, wrong, following the procedures has got to move to enabling and letting people do their thing. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to use that technology do our, our, you know, do their thing. And this, and this is another story from a long time ago is worked with a credit union and it was a union membership, not, not the employees, but the, the members of the credit union were union. And there was a three shift operation where they made trucks. And this was, you know, before all the, the you know, the electronic payments were really out there. And they put an ATM in, in, the, in, the, in the shop or on the floor because mm -hmm. people really, you know, you had 30 minutes, they, they couldn't leave. They had to do whatever the vending machine is or what. And nobody used this ATM. Nobody. And they go, it makes a lot of sense to me. Is it's convenient to get your money. Why, why aren't you doing it? And they said, you know, if we use this machine, one of the tellers is going to lose their job. So the, out of solidarity to, you know, Fellow workers are, you know, they, they didn't use the technology. So anytime we look at technology in the credit union space or the fintech space, we're not replacing people. Mm -hmm. We're just dealing with more volumes. And maybe the job changes, you know, but it's not because we're going to have less people. And then finally, making per taking purpose into action. The credit unions are just awesome at that because we walk the walk of our mission statements, our value statements, and we move it. But as we look forward is... This has to be kind of the definition of how we evaluate employees. I mean, executives or managers, this is how we look at it. And if we use the old thing of, you know, check the boxes that they showed up on time and they had a neat and tidy desk and they didn't yell at anybody today, that's not going to cut it. And I mean, the speed in which things are changing is always increasing, especially in business. And uh, you'll, you'll have to forgive me. I can't remember who exactly gave the quote, but I think it was a famous general. He said, Charles Duell. No, Wait, no, not, that, not that quote. That was a great quote, but we'll go with some. <laughs> I only got one today. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. You're, you're done. We've checked that box. Uh, essentially, the plan is worthless. Planning is everything. So the whole concept was that we can go through this process of making this plan, but when we get out there, that plan is probably going to go out the window. But because we spent so much time making this plan and developing this plan, yeah. we're going to have other avenues and different directions to go down. I see that all the time. You know, let's double down on programming because we cannot not say we had the wrong one. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we just keep throwing money, money at it. And it's okay to say it didn't work. Yep. It, that's okay. So this next thing that we're talking about too, with the leader of the future, they're going to be transformative. And the thing I want to kind of bring everybody's attention to is that fourth bullet, you know, all, again, definition obvious, obviously we want all our managers to do things, but that fourth one's very interesting. Able to think like a new CEO. In the Fortune 500 world, they, they'll do studies that look at new CEOs will get like a 7% better return on on a business than an existing ceo because it's new different change a low-hanging fruit goes away and, and they have a direction and you know the wall street likes the the new story so they do that so if you are a long-term ceo you really do need to be able to reinvent yourself and to be able to look like a new ceo and and the best story i, I i've ever heard about this was um key bank 
they were the ones that actually invented it was called the rock and roll atm they actually put marketing messages and uh, you know would you like to try this on the atm it wasn't just the four little lines do you want to take it from your savings account <laughs> checking account you did a great job so the wall street journal was interviewing the ceo about this new young gun marketing person that came up with this and he came from procter and gamble so how's a soap guy going to be selling you know all this high high you know the, the, these financial services and the guy was great. the ceo says great this is what he goes you know, this guy's incredible. He's innovative. And sometimes we have to say, Steve, that's great, but that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with new regulations. He, you, know, you know, regulations, you know, who, what's a regulation? He was just coming up with these new cool ideas. So when, when, when we look at that transformative leader, that fifth bullet so important as well is, you know, we're never going to ever tie up a year in a neat and tidy bow and move on to the next year. There's going to be overlap. There's going to be new information. We need to be agile. We need to look at that. And so as a board, if you reward and recognize your, your, you know, your CEO, your senior management team, how are you getting that into the mix? You know, how are you looking at it every day? There's new information. And especially last year, every month, it was like delinquency is going to hit or delinquency going to hit. Why, why are we hitting our month, our annual mortgage goal by June? You know, what, what's happening? So the idea is that it, it, it is evolutionary and those those managers are going to be successful in the new normal so one of the things we want to kind of highlight as we finish up here is is talking about uh you know the engagement and maybe a model for the future so there's several ways that you can assess employee engagement so typically you have some sort of Likert scale such as a one to five point scale one to six point scale and you would ask people the extent to which that they agree or disagree with various statements so you could have a more specific approach to engagement and ask them about their energy or vigor towards their work, um, how enthusiastic they are about their job, um, or how engrossed they feel in their work projects. And some examples of uh, the Hilton engagement items are on the far right that you can see. Now, if you're taking a broader approach, which some of our clients like to do, you could assess overall employee experience. Uh, to assess how engaged an employee might be. Now, the employee experience is a larger research initiative that we have that incorporates employee engagement, supervision and management, and organizational culture. And it captures nine broad areas. So things like working conditions, job content, credit union management, communications, morale, supervision, advancement opportunities, compensation, benefits. And basically, it has 90 items, and the employee responds to each of those strongly agree or slightly disagree. Now, if you want to get a better picture of engagement, not just at one point in time, you can monitor changes over time. For instance, assess, uh, take an engagement poll every, every six months or a year and see how that's changing. Now, you can also compare your organization relative to peer and see if anything needs to be done in terms of overall engagement or the entire employee experience. So, so Dean, one of the biggest pushbacks that I get from clients is, you know, I guess I'd call it survey fatigue. Why, how, why do we do this every quarter? Because we don't have enough time to move the needle of put things in place. But I think what's, what sometimes we're missing from that discussion is people want to want you to ask them how they're doing. And this is a tool. Do you need to do 90 questions every quarter? No. You don't no. necessarily need to do 90 questions. However, you would be shocked at how quick it actually takes. I mean, if you're assuming uh, three to four seconds an <laughs> item, 90 questions I'm will slow. zoom by. <laughs> Think about your questions. So, yeah. so slow. <laughs> so 90 may seem like a lot, but it really doesn't take that long. As yeah, far I, as yeah. repeating the questions, we want to be able to go back in time and say, hey, on average, people are feeling this way about this particular item or, um, you know, here's their level of engagement and how it's shifting. Yeah. Now, what if something important in the organization happened that drastically affected engagement? So we have a new CEO or new management or you know, a new well, you supervisor. Know, you know, the biggest one I get is like, we just changed core software and everybody's been working weekends and nobody was allowed to take vacations. Let's do not do an employee survey now because the results are not going to get good results. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's the time to vent and hear the true, true time true to take person. action as well. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. find out where some of those fires are. Yeah. Well, that's actually why we were very curious to see our engagement results in 2020, especially yeah. with oh, the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Affecting people, we were curious to see if engagement means would be significantly lower to, to, 
compared to yeah. past years. And we're going to get to that slide coming up in a bit. So oh, okay. you're just going to have to hang on to the patient. edge of your seat. Bated breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in charge of the button here. I can go there anytime I want. Y'all, y'all come along we, for the ride. We have, have given wait, John. John, you're going to have to yeah. wait. We've given him way too much power. Exactly. That's exactly. So we wanted to show you some of our, our findings from uh, our peer data set regarding engagement. And we surveyed, and I was uh, supposed to say nearly 20,000 employees, nearly wow. 20,000 from almost 50 uh, different credit unions. <laughs> Apparently that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> with a response rate of approximately 81%. And we found moderate to strong relationships with engagement and numerous elements of the employee experience. So specifically, as engagement increases, employees tend to be moderately satisfied with their working conditions, communication, uh, their pay benefits, and uh, they're more satisfied with the credit union's pandemic response. And we asked survey questions about whether employees expected to be working for the credit union 12 months from now and whether they think of working anywhere elsewhere. And what we found is that more engaged employees are much more committed to the company and significantly less likely to leave compared to less employed less engaged employees. So, and then we also found that the strongest relationships tended to be between engagement and job content, supervision, management, morale, and overall job satisfaction. Now, what does this mean? That means that not just the conditions of the job, but yeah, also yeah. the relationships with other people, such as superiors, have a large impact on how engaged employees are in their jobs. And that's also, I'm so, so worried about that remote workforce is, there's no, you know, a virtual water cooler is different than, you know, an actual water cooler. They're going to lunch together. And that's, as we plan for the future, that's where you see a lot of people trying to make those investments to make it as the new normal as, as much as possible, because that's so important to this overall score. Yes. And checking in with people. Okay. Let's see. Who has the controls? I'm not, I'm not changing. I'm, I'm on strike. Quite frankly, I'm not changing any more slides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So the moment you've been waiting for. Here we have a graph of employee engagement means and overall experience means across time. So as a reminder, engagement uh, was rated on a one to six point scale with higher means being indicative of greater engagement. So you can see across time that engagement is fairly high and fairly consistent as well as overall employee experience. And the correlation between um, overall employee experience and engagement was about 0.9, so fairly highly correlated. Now, it's interesting, if you see the areas where we circled, during the financial crisis, engagement remained fairly high in the beginning, but when the financial crisis ended in 2010, engagement dipped. Now let's take a look at 2020. We have high engagement during the pandemic, an average of five out of six. But time will tell if we'll see a similar shift in later years. In other words, is engagement going to fall as the pandemic drags on and on? John, I know you have some opinions about this one. I wanted you to play some like organ music, like Bella Lugosi. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so after, after 30 plus years of doing this, this is a cycle I've seen before. We go back to 08 and 9 and 10. In, in year one, everything's fine. Keep my head down. I'm not going to complain about anything. I love my job. Keep paying me. Don't lay me off. Happy to be here. Happy, happy to be here. Year two, I'm happy to be here. My nose is down, nose to the grindstone. No complaints for me. But you know, my buddy in that other department, he's been really complaining. I'd, I'd start worrying about him if I was you. And then in year three, it's, I'm out of here. <laughs> so we look at this cycle and I start to see this pattern. You see it in 12, 13, and 14 too. Not as dramatic, but look. You go 512, 56, 499, you, you see the same thing happen on uh, uh, overall experience, and we see it at 16, 17, and 18. So do you think that the 5.0 in 2020 is a false positive in yeah, terms of engagement? Yeah, so my, my hunch is like almost like a Putin election. 99% people vote for Putin. So my concern is I think, I think we need to you know, champion that we've done a good job, but we can't lose turf. And there's a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, now, this is a Qualtrics is another company that does a lot of employment engagement. Some of some of our clients use them. Look at this. In, in their materials, they're touting the fact that, hey, all these companies did a great job. Look, self reported engagement went up 13% from 19 to 20. Well, 20, when 40% of ho ho hospitality workers, hotel, restaurant, um, you know, retail people were out of work. 
I'm very happy with my job in financial services. And look, intent to stay, they really played up that 17% improvement, uh, improvement from 19 to 20. Why? Because there wasn't any uh, 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 options out there. You just stayed with the course. And what I'm worried about is this one. Between 19 and 20, taking action on employee feedback went down 7%. And I guarantee you that trend continues. We're in that year three of I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. What did we ask a lot of employees to do this? Lower raises for staff. When somebody left, sometimes we didn't replace them. Say, so can you can you do can you five guys do the work of six until uh, we get back more with track? less? You know, people did a lot of people did recognition bonuses for you know for their COVID service and, and things like that. But there's kind of a promise to pay down the road mentality. Like we're going to take care of you, and so we saw in, in you know I'm go back in that period, you know eight nine and ten we didn't get back to them. You know some people did, but collectively, and then that's when we had the turnover. You know, that's what I'm worried about. That's what the message was today is if you're going to ask people what they think or how they feel or what they want, and you don't provide feedback, we're going to go back to this pattern. And then you're going to wonder why you can't keep people in the seats. That's think, my concern. I think that makes a lot of sense. You have to be able to act on people's constructive criticism. Otherwise, they, they're going to think that the surveys are just uh, because you have to. Yeah, you know, one of, one of the first surveys I ever did was... Uh, the, the branches c complained that they had to share restroom facilities with members. And, it, you know, like, come on, no big deal. You, you need it a couple times a day. Why is it? But as soon as they, they reconfigured branches and they said an employee only restroom facility, the number shot up. They didn't pay them any more money. <laughs> they, didn't, you know, they, they didn't get any group hugs. They just got a restroom, you know? Simple change. Simple change. And it made a big impact. Number one, number one employee benefit, Jeff, here's a, test i'll bring it on i don't know i'm waiting for yeah. it I'm ice, ice machine oh clearly i mean that was top of the mind i was ready for that one <laughs> you, you put an ice machine in everybody everybody goes happy i see that's why we have that opal ice machine right the, the good the yeah. chick-fil-a ice hey, oh yes <laughs> but uh it, as we wrap up here um the, the the engagement drivers the things that that we do really well in credit unions that you know for-profit companies wish they could do sense of belonging the corporate social responsibility. I mean, Wall Street is having to make for-profit companies deal with diversity, inclusion, and social responsibility. And we've been doing it since day one. Um, career goals is probably the toughest one to deal with. You know, we're big credit unions in a lot of places, but we're still small businesses. And we don't have a lot of artificial layers. I saw, it, 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 and, you, know, you know, remember the high-tech technique of giving people sample, um, they can come up with their own titles. Ah, uh, yes. You want to hear the best one I heard? I, Last week. We do have a wall of these. So yes, th do. this is going to be added. Chief elbow rubber. Absolutely. And I go, is that a, am I creating a hostile environment by even saying that? <laughs> <laughs> we have a CER. We're not uh, supposed to rub mitten, rub elbows. We're not supposed to do that. And then it was like, he was the hobnobber. You know, he was the one that was supposed to go around and say, make sure all the customers were good. But I go, I don't know. That was a little different. So as we go through this list, um, we do a great job as a Craigian. The thing that I want to take people to take away today is, guess what? close the loop, give that feedback, take action on these surveys and feel supported in these changes because the new normal isn't going to be a change. Right. So um, last slide here, we talk about the opportunity. And, and again, just reinforcing this idea in 2019 with the Qualtrics studies of 63% had the opportunity to provide feedback. It went to 51% in 2020. And I had a hunch that people said, not now I'm busy. We've got to save this organization, this company. Um, you know, just do your job and let's get through this. And then if we go through that three-year cycle concept, there's going to be a point is what's in it for me again, mm -hmm. and why should I suffer? You know, why should I sacrifice when nobody else is and, and those types of things? Gotcha. So just two quick things before, because we're doing okay. We've got a couple of minutes here is um, next week is CUNA GAC and we're a sponsor of the event. So when you attend virtually, you can come to some of our um, uh, work rooms and we can, we can talk. So if there's anything that you like from this discussion and you want to share it with additional volunteers or senior managers, and you want to talk to some of our experts, we're able to make that happen through the, through CUNA. And then the second thing is on March 11th, the, our webinar is going to be about, um, a, a manual for the new CEO. So you know, there's a lot of businesses where a first-time CEO doesn't make it out of 90 days or six months. 
So this, the program will be how to put an onboarding concept together to make everybody successful. And there'll be a derivative of that as we bring senior managers involved as well. But just coming from a governance perspective, how can a board you know, set the stage for success and how can a new CEO set realistic expectations going in? So those two dates next week, see us at the GAC. And this will be the second one I've not been there in person in 34 years. So, so you're st- this is now a, a new habit then. You know, anything done absolutely. once is an accident. Anything done twice done is a habit. Twice. I've done it twice now. <laughs> Well, it looks like we are right up against it. So we're not going to be able to get to the questions that we do have, but we will circle back to you on those questions. Uh, looks like just a couple of them that we can fill in there. Uh, so uh, look for an email in the future about that. But uh, again, these, uh, this webinar has been recorded. So if you missed anything or like to hear anything again, it'll be posted on the website in about three to five days. Uh, also look for a follow-up email that is going to show uh, the slide deck will be able to be downloaded as well. It'll have a survey in there. Let us know how we're doing, what you liked, what you disliked, so we can grow from there. Uh, so without further ado, John, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Jeff. Dr. Rhodes, really do appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy, and we'll talk to you again on the next one. Stay safe, everyone. Take care.